very good to see yes. you. Um, Great to see you too. I'm incredibly excited. So let me let me just be be very brief. Um, I'm going to ask everyone here right now to to open your minds to something that might be new to you, knowing that we've asked the last panel to tune in right now and to comment or to translate what Scott will present when it comes to computational antitrust. But for <laughs> right now, you will hear about the future and I suspect it might be a new experience to, to, to all of you. Uh, to be very brief, Scott is a professor of business administration at the Harvard Business School. Uh, something that is of high interest to me, Scott, if you could explain that in maybe two seconds, your Erdos number is I suspect mine sure. might be 200, uh, but <laughs> I'm amazed by by that. Um, and the, the last thing that I need to say is that Scott is awesome. So we are in for a ride, no pressure, uh, but please, you can take it from there. And thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you for that uh, extraordinary introduction. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll try to live up to it. I'll, I'll quickly answer. So an Erdish number is... Um, your distance, there was this mathematician, um, Erdush, who was extraordinarily prolific, you know, publishing hundreds and hundreds of probably thousands actually of papers. And so in the same sense as a Kevin Bacon number where, you know, it's your, your distance in, in film from Kevin Bacon, there's a concept of an Erdush number, which is your distance from Erdush in math papers. Uh, and so um, I actually have a couple of paths for the three, but but I wrote with um, uh, Noam Elkies, who wrote with somebody who wrote with Erdos, and, and also, interestingly, one of my economist colleagues, uh, Alexander Nichifor, who, who same thing. Um, in any event, um, by the way, I do not have a, my, my, my Erdos Bacon number, which is the sum of your Erdos number and your Bacon number is, uh, you know, is, is mine is still infinite because I've never been in a film, much less one with like actual, like, you know, lead, lead characters. But there are many mathematicians out there who have finite, uh, Erdish Bacon number and, and, you know, it suggests two strategies, right? You could try and lower your Erdish number by publishing more papers or lower your Bacon number by being in more movies. Anyhow, um, so towards this movie frame a little bit. Oh, and tell me quickly, um, you, you mentioned that the other panel is going to do some, some translation afterwards. How does that affect the timing? What are we, uh, what are we aiming for? So half an hour. Um, Great. And yeah, you could. Or and, and if you have less than that, I can you know ask some some questions. So feel free to just to use the time to do what you want. Yeah. Perfect. And audience, please feel free free to throw in questions in the chat and so forth as we go. I'll be monitoring um, as I talk. So I'm going to speak about platform competition in a Web three future. Um, and you know the the ask for this talk was was a little bit unusual. Um, I was asked to give a sci-fi slash futuristic portrait of, you know, how Web3, uh, the sort of new era of the web supported by, you know, public decentralized infrastructure on blockchains might shape platform competition. Uh, and so, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about stuff that is, uh, you know, that is, that is sort of modern, but, but in a little bit of a futuristic frame. So we're going to, we're going to be imagining, um, you know, what it might look like at scale. Uh, although, as I say, and I'll, and I'll point out, you know, some of this future is already here, right? A lot, you know, everything, almost everything, some of the virtual reality technology I'll point to might doesn't quite exist yet, but, uh, you know, but all of the, all of the infrastructure and sort of like, you know, sort of implications for competition actually exist with technologies that exist today. I'm just going to sort of take them to a bit of an extreme. Uh, amazing. Uh, Mark uh, reports that he has a, a, a finite Erdős Bacon number, which is awesome. Uh, you'll have to tell me after after the session how. Um, so the the actual content of the talk is heavily based on a paper with Christian Catalini and CPI Tech Reg Chronicle uh, called "Can Web Three Bring Back Competition to Digital Platforms?" So if you want to read, you know, the the written and a little bit less futurist uh, version of it, please check that out. And then last, this is sort of a disclosure um, and sort of a citation. Um, I'll be picturing some non-fungible token images associated to non-fungible tokens. Um, the vast majority of them I own. Um, so uh, that often actually conveys intellectual property rights, like the, the opportunity to include them in, in sort of uh, derivative works, but it's also a disclosure, right? Like I'm, I guess, implicitly like showing a, a, a few assets that I own. These are not advertisements. This is not financial advice. These are examples being used in a talk. So, uh, why sci-fi, I, I admit, uh, 
I don't know for sure, but it's possible that this has something to do with the fact that I have written what I believe is the only science fiction case in the Harvard Business School case library, which is set in the world of Ready Player One, where there's this platform called the Oasis. So imagine, if you will, you know, the far future, the you know, Ready Player One is set around 2042, 2045. There's a you know, pervasive, global, immersive virtual reality platform that everyone spends almost all of their time in. And when you, you know, log in, you're sort of like, you know, sort of pulled through this portal, uh, you know, sort of sucked forward into the Oasis world. Uh, and just as you sort of like enter the universe of the game, you pass through the sort of classic line, ready player one. So why do people go to the Oasis? Well, there's this line, people come to the Oasis for all the things they can do, but they stay for all the things they can be. Suddenly you're like, you know, sort of freed from, you know, the need to be a human or to like, you know, have long hair or, um, you know, whatever. You could be anyone you want. You could be this uh, citizen of Tajigan character or potentially this duck. And what does it mean when we say that you are this character? Well, in our Web3 future, what this really means is that there's a digital asset, like you own a, like a digital token that's sort of a, like a reference and contains information that's like the character you can put on for yourself and it's stored in your personal crypto wallet. So you, the Oasis is some platform, but you own this citizen of Tajigan or, or this subduck. Um, you also, you know, you know, could be anything, right? It could be like, you know, an, an otter or a seal or a will of the wisp or something. But whatever the case, you know, you're carrying this character with you. And when you enter the oasis, you essentially like put it on like a costume. Um, and how do you do that? Well, digital ownership is structured with like users holding their data, credentials, and other digital assets. So like everything in your sort of digital self in a personal application called a crypto wallet. Like you actually control this application. Um, and what we mean by that is like, you know, it's, it's, it's control in the sense of possession. Like every one of these pieces of data, right? The data that is this citizen of Tajigan, this data that is this duck, I actually control in an application. I have a, you know, a, a private, wallet address that I can manipulate. I can choose to send them elsewhere. I can choose to like attach them to applications. I can put them on as a character. I can take them off. Um, and so it's just like having physical property, except it's digital, right? Like it's yours. You can dispose of it. You can use it. You can use any features it has. And this is very different from the way that we're used to platforms holding data today, right? Like in classic Web2 platforms, think Facebook and Twitter and so forth, the data is stored on the platform and you might not be able to extract it at all. But at minimum, when you when you put it on the platform, you you hand over a bunch of rights and you know the platform is the controller of it, right? If you know, and, and sometimes to extreme degrees, right? Like sometimes the platform has the right to use any image you upload in whatever promotional materials they want or something of the sort. Here, not that, not so. In our in our web three future. The user controls all of the data in their own personal, like, you know, digital wallet, which is just like a physical wallet and that you can like, you know, carry it around with yourself when you go from place to place, in this case, digital place to place on the internet. And you control what happens with whatever's in it. So here are my digital assets stored in my personal crypto wallet. To get to the Oasis, you connect your wallet, and then the Oasis is gonna read these digital assets. It looks at your application, which you have now given it the right to see, and says, aha, you have this citizen of Tajigan, you have this Supduck, you can be either of these characters in the Oasis. And so it's like a, it's like a, you know, an import operation, but it's import by reference. The assets stay in your wallet, but now the Oasis reads them and uses whatever features they have for use in the Oasis. So this is very different, as I've said, from Web2. And in particular, it makes assets very portable, right? Like you hold them 
and you take them from platform to platform. And this is very much, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, an opportunity at least for platforms to compete, right? If the, um, if the Oasis only offers, you know, some metaverse functionalities and maybe some new platform will spring up and offer new functionalities and say, hey, you know, we've, we've we're more fun. We have better, you know, opportunities for the user um, or, you know, better yields if it's an investment vehicle or something of the sort. And all you have to do to transfer, you know, to leave the Oasis and move to some new platform is just change where your wallet is connected. There's no like extracting data, changing its format, re-uploading it. Like it's really hard to leave a place, a platform like Facebook or Twitter but in the, uh, you know, in this web three sci-fi world, all you do is like, you know, unplug and plug in. Uh, by the way, this is something that already happens. There are very extreme examples actually of it in decentralized finance where you have various platforms um, competing on return and people like literally algorithmically re-optimize their portfolio in real time across these different, um, you know, sort of you know, investment opportunities. Uh, it's called yield farming and because all you have to do is like sort of like you know ex, you know sort of unplug and plug in i'm slightly oversimplifying it's very easy for people to re-optimize and as a result there's like significant competition among the platforms and what they offer that by the way as a side note can have all sorts of negative consequences when the platforms themselves are non-transparent and compete on um you know on unobservable you know sort of unobservable you know features but have unobservable risks but if the whole platform is transparent and you know, you know, and, and algorithmically sort of structured so as to be stable, um, this can actually sort of just drive you know a net positive competitive force. So, you know, realistically, you know, maybe the citizens of Tajigan are most useful in their metaverse called the shelter. The subducts are used in their metaverse called the boardwalk. There are other metaverses. There's academia. There's even Meta, whatever they launch, you know, sort of over in the corner for for workplaces or something of the sort. There isn't just one metaverse, there are many platforms because it's easy for me to move from one to another. And in markets where switching costs are really low and like technological uh, excuse me, specificity is valuable, you tend to get specialization. You get individual niche platforms focusing on different things. The boardwalk is where all the subducts chill out. Whatever the, the meta, you know, metaverse is, is maybe where people have a lot of meetings, uh, you know, We'll give it some funny pronunciation like academia or something uh, is where all the academics hang out for their digital conferences. There really is already a platform called the academic metaverse uh, that some friends of mine uh, launched after they they built a platform sort of or a, a platform uh, wrapper for uh, for use for conferences. They decided, why don't we like just turn this into a you know, a day to day metaverse for for other academics to hang out. And that's not all. So all these assets live on public blockchains, right? It's not that like, you know, you just have these things in your crypto wallets, but in fact, what your crypto wallet really is, is a way of manipulating public information that's stored on a decentralized blockchain that no individual entity controls and is public and has standards, right? All of these different digital assets are interoperable across different platforms. And so you might have, you know, your, uh, you know, your sort of mushroom terrarium and in the shelter, it's a magical item. If you eat your mushrooms, then, uh, then you sort of gain magical powers for 12 hours or something like that. That's a game world. That's what the mushrooms do there. You know, in the, uh, you know, in, in meta, maybe it's a display item that just sort of sits on your, um, you know, sits on the center of a conference table or something of the sort. You know, it's like, uh, you know, sort of, but, but this single asset, which lives in your crypto wallet, you can connect to two different platforms at once and it manifests in different ways in the two different platforms. And in, what did I call it, academia or whatever, uh, maybe this is actually a teaching object. It's used to like teach people uh, about the science of fungi or something like that. Again, you're sort of giving users individual as control 
of interoperable assets opens tremendous new opportunities for people to, you know, build their identity and move it from space to space and keep a part of their identity sort of with them as they go from place to place, right? If you have, you know, a favorite, you know, mushroom display or a favorite sword from a video game like Zelda or something like that, you can take it and turn it into an office display. All using the same underlying code because it lives on an interoperable standard. And of course, interoperability is actually something that users enjoy, right? It's cool if you have a favorite, uh, you know, if you have this favorite asset, you can move it from place to place. It's also just easier, right? Like, you know, if I wanted to upload that image to three different platforms, I could, but it's much easier just to be able to have the platforms reference one master copy. All of this is actually lower friction for consumers. And so, you know, by, by 2042, the consumers demand it, absolutely demand it of centralized platforms. You know, Facebook, you're not going to be uploading images, you're going to be pointing your account at all the images that are, you know, sort of you already hold in your own digital asset repository. Again, this isn't that far off. Um, you know, Twitter already lets you set as your profile picture a non fungible token that you own by connecting your crypto wallet and then just establishing a pointer. And so now, by 2042, 2045, consumers demand portability. They want their digital assets to be transferable across platforms and interoperable and easy to use. And that starts to exert some pressure, right? If you're facing a world where all the customers want to be able to use their digital assets across platforms, and you're the only one that doesn't do that, even if you have significant network effects, you might be in trouble. And so, you know, maybe even the giants will start to allow apps to, or sorry, other, other third-party applications to point to digital assets created in that giant. And that even includes their competitors, right? It's one thing to bring like, you know, sort of something from your, your meta metaverse to the shelter, um, probably not a direct competitor. It's another to be able to reference an Instagram image on Twitter directly. But on the other hand, that's much better than having it happen on some third party platform that you don't control, right? You'd rather that Instagram be a source that people are referencing in all of this different activity. And so, you know, by, by 2042, maybe the platforms have really had to open up and allow all of this cross referencing and grant users more control over their digital assets than they ever had before. And again, this is already starting to happen. Um, you know, uh, Meta has launched, uh, you know, a, a, an NFT minting platform. Twitter, as I said, has this like, you know, NFT pointer system. Um, this is gradually becoming the world because all of these digital goods are being created and people want to use them. And there's a lot of market value to being one of the sources of those digital goods, being a place where people create these things and where they share them and use them. But again, the way that this interoperable infrastructure enables people to use it changes what they demand out of those digital goods. And in particular, they demand the ability to bring them with them and transfer them from platform to platform. So we've talked about portability and interoperability. Another thing that, that blockchains bring us is what's called verification. Right. So for land, you know, for for most forms of property, especially very valuable property these days, um, we rely these days, you know, in, in, in 2022, like, you know, sort of today land, uh, not 2042. We rely on government institutions or, or, or other like intermediaries that certify ownership. But here certification is programmed in. Right. When you create an asset on a blockchain, it's immediately clear who owns it, who created it. And to some degree, what it is, um, again, to some degree, like, you know, if, if, it, if the digital asset guarantees you access to some real world event, 
that real world event part is not sort of encoded in what lives in digital space. And indeed, there's a lot of there's been a lot of friction and challenges um, with, you know, uh, what are colloquially called rug pulls, where, where people create digital assets that then cease to behave as expected. But, you know, the process at least of creating them and to the extent that they do live in digital space, that part is, is verifiable and, and sort of can be made permanent or effectively permanent, which means it's much easier to enter without an intermediary. We've seen this explosion again today in 2022 of people entering and creating various forms of, of digital imagery and other sort of digital um, and digital artworks, collectibles, um, you know, sort of records of, of various activities. Um, without the normal intermediaries like galleries that would help you sell these works and that's because you can create an asset and you can establish property rights you know clear property rights around it without needing the intermediary and meanwhile because all of this lives on a, a public ledger right all of the infrastructure in in a blockchain or in most blockchains is is publicly accessible if you're a new entrant you can look at the existing library of content. It's like being able, you know, if you're launching your new like video service, it's like being able to look at all of the YouTube video library and like import the parts of it that you want. And so on both the supply and demand side, we've made entry easier, which again, hopefully should be a force for competition. And again, how much easier does entry get? Well, here we have, you know, a, a sneaky vampire syndicate NFT created by you know, a bunch of anonymous individuals, uh, MIG, Topkeck, and Woof, um, and there, there are three others, I think, on the team as well. Normally, like, you know, sort of establishing, like, provenance and, like, you know, all, all of the things that we would normally care about with these physical, with physical assets and, and property rights, very hard to do in digital space, especially when there's no intermediary verifying the identity of the creators and, and that the property right they've established is real. Here again, this is like all just living inside of the system. When they create the asset, suddenly now everyone can see what it is. They can see that it was created, right? This property right around the image was established and they can buy it, they can sell it, they can trade it, they can display it, whatever they want. And meanwhile, on the, on the, uh, you know, on the other side of the market, we have literally what are called vampire attacks. So. We talked about competition coming from on one side from consumers driving demand for interoperability. Meanwhile, now leveraging the, the existing infrastructure, we have platforms that launch by like looking at who the major users of their competitors are and then offering those users direct incentives to switch. It's a vampire attack. You're like sucking the lifeblood out of a platform. So here is OpenSea, and there's that sneaky vampire syndicate. This is the, you know, the, the market leading uh, NFT trading platform. Here is that same sneaky vampire syndicate NFT on another platform called Looks Rare, and a third platform called X2Y2, and then an aggregator that reads all of the listings on all of these different platforms and sort of like brings them together into a single unified source. They're all just doing this by looking at the open records and, and, and on the infrastructure layer, they're reading the blockchain for NFT listings and, and serving them all jointly together. And they can do that because all of that information is public. And indeed, both LooksRare and X2Y2 launched by offering direct incentives to some of the biggest NFT traders to transfer over and do their trading on their platforms. It's a little bit like airline status match, except here verifying who the high status individuals are is easy and can be done without even like, you know, informing them. You just look at the blockchain, see who's trading a lot and offer them incentives to switch. And then, you know, just, just quickly, this really has even today had significant impact on, uh, you know, on, on market shares. Um, you can see sort of these these big changes often are associated with like changes in pricing or, or new reward structures. Um, but like, you know, OpenSea is this big purple block. You know, when LooksRare launched, they took on a big share of the market. Um, when X2Y2 decided to reduce, pr you know, reduce price, they took on a much larger share of the market. Uh, and then Blur, which is like a, a new platform that just launched recently. Uh, so like, like, look at this, in, in a year we've had three major competitors to a brand leading platform, uh, very different from, you know, all with significant market share, very different from what we see in web two. And a big part of that is this opportunity for these vampire attacks. 
And then last, uh, and I know we're coming close to time, so I'll be very quick, but then the other thing is just like with open source software, in our digital future, it's much easier to build on top of other assets, to look again, using that infrastructure, using what's already there and saying like, look, what can we add to it? How can I build more around it? You know, maybe here we have a chain runner and we add the, you know, a Santa hat. This was really a project. There's a, there's a, a team that created the chain runners, which look like this. And there's another team that created an application that basically reads a chain runner, non-fungible token and puts a Santa hat on it, which sounds like, you know, a little silly from a, you know, this, this is not a major application, but from a branded intellectual property perspective, it's huge. The chain runners open sourced their brand. They went, they made the entire project um, CC zero, Creative Commons zero, which in, you know basically was an invitation to others to come and build and like create new assets and variations. And that drives a bunch of activity back into the original brand, makes more people aware of it and, and, and drives more creation and attention. Um, and we can see this like at every part of the software layer. So by 2042, digital assets will be interoperable and portable, I hope. Um, it'll be easy to verify, it'll be easy to create new ones with, without, you know, sort of an intermediary supporting the process. And they'll be composable, like people will sort of look at what's out there and, and build new features around it, just like, um, you know, just like we see in open source software. But perhaps most powerfully, I think it's just the simple feature that like there will be a digital goods economy. People will think of data as something that they can own. And lots of data that sort of currently lives inside of platforms or that nobody really owns, it's sort of digital exhaust, like, you know, the history, like your work history at a summer internship or like, you know, your, your, your interaction history on a platform will actually be something that belongs to you and you can take with you and, and make use of later in like very fine grained micro detailed ways. And then towards competition, all of that should hopefully increase consumer leverage relative to platforms. Uh, again, especially when the infrastructure is open and interoperable, making it very easy for new platforms to show up. And so the hope is that this promotes virtuous competition that drives you know, towards better features, better infrastructure, lower prices. And again, we're already starting to see sort of beginnings and hints of that in the, in the Web3 world today. We're not yet at 2042. And by the way, in the story of Ready Player One, you know, everyone spends all their time in the Oasis because of massive environmental disasters. So like, you know, I hope we don't end up quite in that story. Um, but there's lots of challenges to actually make this Web3 future real, right? First of all, there, there are many challenges around consumer protection and access and use of the technology. I also mentioned this idea that like, it, it actually makes competition very intense in certain sectors, but like in, in finance, um, if it's possible to compete on observable features while taking unobservable risks and cost reductions, that can actually snowball in a really negative way. Um, I have an article with Shai Bernstein that came out this morning, actually, um, that argues that that's a big part of what happened with the recent centralized finance collapses. Um, just like in previous financial crises, um, you know, different financial firms were incentivized to offer really attractive looking financial products that were based on very opaque risks. Uh, and so we need much more transparency and and in you know, regulatory frameworks as well to support virtuous competition rather than just having sort of maximally intense competition, um, you know, with a lot of opaque drivers under the hood. Uh, and then the um, the Ethereum merge did a took a big step in the right direction uh, on environmental impact. So taking a th the Ethereum network in particular from very uh, high cost, um, you know, high energy cost to super low, but like. You know, still like we're, we don't have sustainable platforms for managing any of this. And so in order to get to a 2042 where we see all of this competition and people have these very intense digital futures, um, we need to build the infrastructure to support it. But if we get there, there's quite a big opportunity. You know, you can be uh, a Tajigan or a duck uh, in a world full of, you know, pro-consumer vampires, strange metaphor, but OK. Um, you know, carrying your, um, you know, your terrarium from place to place and, you know, adding Santa hats, you know, with, as appropriate for the holidays, QED. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, 
I just want to make one comment and, and we have one question in the chats and then move on to the reactions of the, the last panel of the day. My comment is the following. I, I think we see a surrender by the big Web2 companies because indeed, if they are to design their own layer one blockchain, I'm not sure there is much to gain there. So they do have to rely on existing layer one blockchain and try to find a way to recreate values, which also end up benefiting the layer ones, right? So yep. that there's an interesting dynamic here. The, the question is one that is a pressing question in the space and, and Joe is asking the question actually, whether or not we may still see market power, not because you own necessarily the data, but maybe the reputation, right? So you'll be stuck in the environment because you have good reputation and and and, and friends and totally. In 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 fact, um, one another one of my co-authors, Jad Esber, and I have thought a lot about this, and we argue that sort of there's a new and very powerful, possibly more powerful than previous forms of network effects um, here, network effect here um, that comes from community cohesion. Right. If your if your user community really loves your platform, right? You have you have designed a good platform or a good ecosystem with good with high quality users and, and experiences and so forth. That alone can sort of serve as a network effect, and Web three actually accelerates that. Right. It makes it possible for individual users to own a stake in a platform in a way that incentivizes them to help build up the platform and its associated brand. Um, the hope is that that type of competition actually like proceeds in a way that is pretty virtuous that you sort of you, that, that that when you have these like very, very cohesive communities that actually comes through like high quality platform interactions. And so while there is a degree of, of, of market power associated to it, it you, you sustain it, but you, you sustain that cohesion by per continuing to provide high quality experiences and services. And you're always sort of facing this threat that the community might very quickly like just transfer elsewhere. We hope well. Yes, and and that's <laughs> incredibly interesting from an academic perspective, right? It means that the concept of market power may be totally different, or may mean or cover something different in the future than than in twenty twenty two. You mentioned twenty forty two quite a few times. Please be sure that I will come back to you in twenty forty two, January the 1st. amazing. <laughs> um, but thank you so very much. Uh, we received question the the video we hope uh will be available of your talk and pretty much the entire conference on our youtube channel uh but for now we move on to to the very next panel of the day scott again thank you so very much it's been a real pleasure to to listen to your take futuristic sake uh <laughs> and we'll we'll try to continue the sci-fi discussion 